Welcome to Monster Porn, Weird Fiction and Horror Podcast. The podcast where the spirit is willing and the flesh is also willing. Today's story, The High Striker by Matt Cummins. Brett, thank God. I love the guy, but shit has been so weird lately. My wife is out of town with the girls and my in-laws. The possibilities are endless. What was that? No, screw it. Who cares? Pizza's on the way. Beer's in the fridge. Queuing up a horror flick. Let's see. The Exorcist. The Babadook. It follows. Man, I've seen them all. Rob Zombie flicks? No, that's too much gore. Oh, I could go B-grade. B-grade gore doesn't bother me. Oh, Ash vs. Evil Dead. This is great. No one is around. Speaking of no one is around... (laughs) Jesus! Oh, Puggles! Hey, what's up, buddy? What are you doing? If you weren't a pig, and if I weren't a sober, sane, rational, frankly pretty damn good-looking adult, I think you just grinned and laughed. You know, I was just thinking... Shut the fuck up, meat sack. Damn, it feels great to be out of that pig. Gotta find a way to make this permanent. Maybe I can sacrifice the tall one. He's the one who fucked up the incantation and summoned me as a pig. No, I'll put the tall one inside of a pig. It'll move into his empty skin suit, make him write his stories with those dainty little cloven feet, carry him around in that stupid man purse that this idiot put me in. I've done it. I've seen myself from outside the confines of this corporal vessel. I, uh, I see. Hmm. Perhaps it was only the mirror. Note to self, next time don't do astral projection rituals in the mirror room. That is only for summoning the doppelganger. Oh, that's strange. Matt has arrived on time. Did I cross some plane of existence? He's actually three minutes early. He's never been this early in his life. If you died today, do you know where your soul... Matt, is there an emergency? No? What? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I mean, no? Uh, I'm supposed to be here before. I'm actually early. Precisely. Dude, I'm always early. And the green god doesn't have a seventh toe. Whatever you... <clears throat> Dude, uh... Yeah. There's something not quite right about Matt's eyes. There's a blackness to them. His pupils seem dilated and his voice scratchy, almost gruff. Also, he hasn't brought the pig. That odd pig. Brent? Yes, Matt. Are you go- <clears throat> Sorry, this is dang cold. Are you gonna let me inside? I don't want to. Something is off. Matt shouldn't be here for 20 or 30 minutes. Maybe an hour. His voice is familiar, like... The voice of the desolate... Wait, who is the desolator? Brett? I don't know, Matt. There was a... a sign in the tea leaves. I'm sorry, I feel like we should record another day. Well... Oh, <clears throat> well, okay, well, that, that's all as well. 
I've been having a terrible day also. I found the desk... <clears throat> Puggles. He was, he was lying in the backyard, dead. Sporting a massive erection. I think he became oxygen deprived because of the size of it. Oh, that explains perhaps everything. But does it? Matt's eyes are different. Perhaps he has been weeping. Maybe his voice is scratchy from wailing like a whiny little bitch. Perhaps he's so upset he couldn't wait to come over here. Okay. What's in the bag, Matt? Oh, oh this? Just, uh, you know, I'm not quite ready to accept that he's gone. It was Pug's carrying case. Okay, then. I come in. <clears throat> All right. Are you ready to record? Yeah. Uh, don't forget our, our pre-recording ritual. Uh, I brought the vinegar and honey this time. Oh, good. I'm out. And we need our voices silky smooth. All right. Pour it out. Yes, drink up. The vinegar was strong. Perhaps too bitter. I feel, uh, I feel... What you feel is your soul being siphoned. <laughs> Let's have a look inside this baggie. Blood of the gods, Matt. Is that... Is that the pig's body? It was. Now it's your body, meat sack. Oh, great god Wedget of Abydos. Hey, what? How did I get to Brett's house? This is weird. Huh, guess I probably came over here to record. We were supposed to record today. Though I don't know why Brett and Puggles decided it was a good time to snuggle up on the floor and sleep. Yeah, let's, uh, let's get on to the recording for this week. Curiosity was my only gateway drug. Everything after that was a naturally occurring sequence. One domino tipping over and tumbling into the next tile and so on. My mother would try to placate my natural inquisitiveness by keeping me entertained, which included a once a year trip to the old defunct circus on the edge of town where an annual carnival was held. The facilities were rough, but with a little elbow grease beforehand and some winterizing afterwards, the joint effort between the city and the carnies kept it running. The city made enough money for the week to keep ignoring the property until the next year. The carnies used it for the working equipment and the space. I went every summer. I got drunk on the smells of popcorn and deep fried Oreo cookies and dust kicked up from the dry late summer air. From the old rickety wooden roller coaster, I'd throw my hands into the air and scream into the dying summer light. I'd climb off of the roller coaster, the earth swaying, and then run to the next ride. I went on the octopus, the tilt-a-whirl, and the zipper, and only the zipper would make me get that rocking, seasick feeling. After that, I'd grab a soda and some candy to calm my gut. Then I was off for a cool-down ride on the Ferris wheel before playing the carny games. I was fascinated by the games. I studied intensely as people lined up and handed over their cash to play something rigged. They might as well have dumped their money into a hole filled with gasoline and tossed in a cigarette. But if you watched closely, you could see the sleight of hand. The bottle game was the easiest one. The bottles were weighted and the carny threw the ball at the bottle. The heaviest one was on the top and he just stood inside of the line so that the thin plastic ball would connect with a little more momentum. Every time he threw the ball, it would send the whole tower toppling. See? Easy peasy, Mr. Sleazy. Once I asked him to stack the bottles again, and replace the top three bottles with the bottom three, the tall, gangly, teenaged carny with a face tattoo and the nose piercing leaned in and said, Just throw the ball, kid. I'll give you a stuffed animal if you keep your mouth shut, all right? I did just that, and he gave me a large purple teddy bear. Just for being the 100th participant this week, he said loud enough for the other people in line to hear, and then he leaned down to me and said, Don't mess with me, kid. Now fuck off. I didn't mess with him either. 
His breath reeked of cigarettes and his body odor was sour. It was a chemical lace smell that I'd never smelled before. I didn't realize it then, but now it's pretty easy to see that he was a tweaker and gacked out of his mind. His body odor alone was a dead giveaway that he'd been on a meth binge. It's hard to understand how bad a living human body can smell after it's been awake and on overdrive for a week until you've sat near the reek of it. Later that same week, I went back with a friend to ride the rides. And on the way out, we passed the high striker. The game where you swing the big hammer and try to send the weight to the top of the scale. Running the high striker was a clown. His face was painted white with black around his eyes. And his large red lips were turned down into a frown. There was a blue teardrop painted below his eye. He was the sad clown. His hair was crazy, wavy blonde that he had tied back into a greasy ponytail. He smelled like whiskey and cigars. My grandfather had smelled that same way when I was just a small child. The memories that came with the thought of him were not the kind that made you nostalgic. They were the kind that made you want to run and crawl under the bed to hide despite whatever may be lurking there. Or made you want to turn off the lights, stuff yourself into the closet, and nudge the boogeyman out of the way. I didn't get that afternoon fishing trip of Paps. He wasn't that kind of grandpa. He did show me my first porno, and he also let me drink a beer when I was six. Stand-up guy, that grandpa of mine. I almost didn't take the striker from the clown. That memory of my grandfather was so strong that I nearly walked away. But I was curious so I paid attention as the clown showed me how to hold on to the club and how to swing it. On his first swing, he sent the weight all the way up to the top, making the meter sparkle and buzz with flashing lights. I paid attention to where he placed his feet, and I noticed that when he swung the club, he stomped with his right foot. So when I approached the platform, I stood exactly as he had stood. And though I could barely hoist the massive mallet to chest level, I managed to send the weight to the top with just as much speed as the sad clown. He frowned, looking murderous as his bloody, false frown framed the one on his lips. Double or nothing, I said. He didn't reply. He just stared at me with that same sad frown on his face. And then another carny working behind the booth gave me a poster. It was an old poster, too. It had some lady from the 80s named Bo Derrick on it. I wasn't going to complain, because she might have the greatest set of tits that I've ever seen. Or not seen. I think that's why I liked it so much. My generation has no imagination when it comes to sex because of pornography. We are all one click or swipe away from anything that we want to see. That poster, though, oh, I spent hours that night just trying to imagine where everything lined up. I didn't know that was what was on the poster when the carny gave it to me, though. I just said, thanks, and walked away. I went over to the line for the Ferris wheel and turned to watch as the person who'd been behind me made an impotent attempt at swinging the old hammer. The clown didn't watch him, though. He just sat with that same downturned expression and stared at me. So I left. It was a week or two later that I heard the news. A woman was found beaten to death and strung up by her ankles from the ceiling of an auto body shop. The rope had been looped over a steel beam and tied off to the bumper of a flatbed dump trailer. Her head had been bludgeoned with something large and heavy. The police had gone to question a couple of the carnies, and that routine questioning ended with two badly injured officers and one dead clown. This just happened to be the very next stop the carnival had made. I always wondered if it was that same clown that I'd seen that night. But after that, the carnival never came again.
when I got older, I replaced carnivals, circuses, and science fiction with substances. I started with marijuana like anyone else, but I found it to be a massively overrated experience that left me nervous and paranoid. Unlike everyone else in the room when I smoked it, I became acutely aware of everything. The way the light reflected off of the surface of a cup, the snail shell spirals, the smoke made when it swirled into the cloud forming above the group, the precision and speed of the spider's legs as it crawled across the carpet, or the repetitive hand motion being made by that talkative stoner sitting in the plush seafoam green chair on the north wall of the room, just for examples. I absorbed it all, but I couldn't speak. When I opened my mouth, my mind would wander as I conversed like I was a casual observer outside of my own conversation, and then I'd have a moment of sobriety and snap back into the conversation, having no clue what I was talking about. So, I'd clam up and become a flooding reservoir of information. I'd overload and damn near freak out. Needless to say, pot wasn't a favorite of mine. I also stayed away from drugs like meth, I'd seen enough usage around my hometown to know that after a couple weeks, you could end up looking like a vacuum-sealed storage bag over a skeleton, sands a few teeth, permanently. Coke was fun, but it was too damn expensive. It had a killer come down. Heroin was something I wouldn't touch either. But Oxy was a close cousin, and I did plenty of that, especially when I could mix it with a beer or two. But such things were habit-forming and bad for daily life. So I turned to simpler drugs like huffing those spray cans that people dust their keyboards with. That was the first time that I almost saw something. The high only lasted a couple of seconds, as though I'd been blasted with something nearly hallucinogenic. In that moment, I noticed a point next to the door in my friend's garage, where nothing collected. No pictures or tool racks. There were no dead bugs or dust like the rest of the garage. The spot was just completely blank. As if it were used, but unused. A paradox. The very next day I tried cough syrup. It has a compound in it called dextromethorphan, which acts as a hallucinogen if consumed in large enough volumes and it can be bought over the counter at your nearest five and dime. It's a novice drug, and it's cheaper than dirt, but that doesn't mean that it won't get you twisty. I drank well past what I've been told would cause me to trip, and things got weird. At first, it was just this inexplicable lightness in my limbs. I ran around my apartment feeling as though I were about to float or fall apart at the seams, and in that moment, nothing would have made me happier than if I had collapsed like a deconstructed Mr. Potato Head. Then I saw it. There was a wriggling, a translucent wave in front of me as though the fabric of reality was worn thin, right in the middle of my damn apartment. There was a sound, but I couldn't hear it, because it had color to it. Don't ask me to explain soberly, because I will never be able to explain how when tripping sounds can have colors, and mathematical equations can have odors, and things you touch have sounds. In a sober and functional consciousness, things like that cannot make sense. But in the middle of the trip, it feels as natural as air and water. I slowly approached the distortion. I reached for it, and it rippled around my fingertips as though I were sticking my hands into a puddle. I told myself to take a step and go into it, whatever it was, but my body wouldn't obey. My limbs felt like noodles. My limbs looked like noodles, boneless and wiggling. That is when I passed out, well, physically, but not in my mind. As my body slumped to the floor, I ascended up and through the ceiling, through the texture, the sheetrock, the wood and insulation, and then through the roof, 
and on my way out, I glimpsed what I can only describe as something looking like it was trying to push its way through the distortion. The out-of-body experience was what I had wanted after all. It was all that my friends who had tripped on DXM had talked about. But I was disappointed. And disappointment isn't something you want to experience in the middle of a trip. I soared and then crashed and then woke up in a swirling hangover of phantasmal dreams and a creeping sensation that something was watching me from the periphery. I took a few weeks off to let the paranoia wane before I tripped again. Then, one night, my girlfriend Alicia invited me to a party. I entered the apartment and crossed the room full of familiar faces. There were smiles, cocky smirks, and head nods. Someone from a small group, waxing intellectual in conversation between doing beer bongs, shouted at me. I didn't respond. In the weeks after my last trip, I felt less compelled to be social. Showing up to that party had been uncomfortable enough. I had a feeling the whole world was a sneering face behind a veneer. Even then, when I walked towards Alicia, I looked around the room and found myself questioning the state of everything. Was that nice guy accounting major getting drinks for a larger group of girls really that nice? Or was there a darker and more sinister entity hiding behind that clever smile? Or that theater major with the serious legs and the big DSLs? What was that nervous glint in her eyes? Eyes that seemed to jump right out from the numerous selfies she posted online as though she were so intense in her everyone look at me desires that her sanity was cracked and something was slipping in around the edges. Even Alicia, with all of her fashion, makeup, and her tapestry of tattoos, what was it all if not a sleight of hand agenda? What was really inside of a person? So little that is internal ever becomes external. And the more that becomes external, the more hollow and simple the internal. What was I for that matter? Pete? Alicia said, looking at me with her head half cocked to the side. I had stopped in front of her. I didn't know how long I'd been standing like that. Uh, yeah, babe. I said and tried to smile. You look rough. Work okay? Oh, yeah. Just tired. What's with the hair? What? You look like you just rolled out of bed. Oh, I said and ran a hand through my hair. I hadn't looked in the mirror for over a week. The reflection of reality with nothing askew was worse than the psychedelic liberties taken by an altered mind. I'd found myself looking into my own eyes in the mirror from inches away, trying to see if what I knew to be behind them showed through. Pete? She asked again. Uh, yeah? Hey, hey, do you want a drink? I asked, realizing I was zoning out and I didn't want to appear too affected. Uh, no, I don't want to dull the experience. She said with a coy look about her. What are you talking about? Come on. She said and she led me to the back room. Her hand felt so warm, it was as if I'd been burned back to my senses. As we squeezed toward her back bedroom down a hallway, she pulled my hand around her waist and my junk pressed into the back of her jeans. My cock sluggishly flopped like someone who'd taken too many sleeping pills trying to get out of bed. It nearly came to from what seemed like a coma, but I was too distracted. Strange. That has never happened to me before, I thought. I suppose that I should have felt some sort of injury to my masculine pride. But I was still thinking about how my fingers felt, moving inside whatever that was I'd seen on my last trip. Not real, Petey boy, I thought, trying to convince myself. We sat on her bed. It seemed to be an island in a mess of discarded clothes, 
which were all likely clean. She was a wreck when she tried to get ready. Stayed on enough mornings after to see her rushing and tearing through her closet. Most of her clothes ended up on the floor when she was in a rush. If she'd actually had the time to be indecisive, well, the outcome of that was right in front of me. She leaned over and pulled a black bra off of the handle of her nightstand. I recognized that one. I'd pulled it off of her under the sheets the last time we were together, and then afterward we'd spent nearly ten minutes digging around the bed for it. She folded it and put it into the nightstand and pulled out a small bag. You know how I said my cousins went to Mexico? She asked. Yeah, I said, getting that anticipatory feeling like small fingers working their way up my back. Well, look what they brought back. She unrolled a bag full of gray and fat mushrooms. We'd been talking about trying them for months. Our plan was to try mushrooms and then LSD. It was explorative and uh, intellectual enterprise and exercise. From there, we planned on trying a few different types of mushrooms and then blogging about the effects. Temporary was the word we'd used often. Just a college thing. Just a phase. If that had been true, I suppose I wouldn't be writing this now. In my bedroom. Back at home, where I'm living in my parents' house and working part-time at a grocery store to fill in the time between my sessions with a shrink. A prescription shrink. As if more drugs were what I really needed. Big Petey, a voice said that sounded a little too Polly Shore. Hey, Marco, I said as Alicia tried to tuck the bag out of sight, but it was too late. Marco had spied it. The fungus is among us, Marco said. Radical. We only have enough for two, Alicia said. Oh, man, he said and ran his hand through his long, matted hair. The kind that smells as dirty as it looks. What if I give you a discount on your next bag? I've got some of that shit coming out of Colorado. That legal wreck, you know. Genetically engineered to take you to a whole nother place. Sorry, Marco, Alicia said. This is special. Once in a lifetime shit. And I've been instructed not to split it more than in half. Marco said that he understood though I could tell that the non-communal nature of the exchange was challenging his hippie ideals. I'd almost interjected on Marco's behalf and offered him half of my split, but I couldn't help but think of the last time that I tripped. Deep down, I wanted to see it again. A seed of curiosity was flowering into fascination. Or obsession. Well, my friends, Marco said, if I can't trip with you, then I will be the guide on your journey. He put his arms out wide in his big, baggy, tropical shirt and grinned. And as your guide, I have to recommend going elsewhere because this party is no place to trip. Too much white noise. You know what I mean, bro and bra? I agreed. I'd overload with all of that stimulus. I needed something I could take one moment at a time. That is when Alicia recommended going across town to the site of our first date, a park on the edge of the forest. It was dark outside, but there were enough lamps in the park, and it was a warm summer night. Sitting outside and seeing the stars seemed cool. Maybe we'd see a few shooting stars. Maybe I'd see another distortion. And I was in intrigued as hell by that prospect. But that faint memory of something pushing through made me decide that it was perhaps, you know, not in my best interest to do it in my apartment. Because having that thought in my apartment could trigger a bad trip. I'd never been in the clouds when the sky had gone dark, but I'd seen others go through it and knew it wasn't for me. <laughs> When we arrived at the park, 
there were a couple of tween skateboarders grinding their boards across a balance bar. The taller one shot us a look of concern and then he stashed his cigarette in the palm of his hand and put that hand back as though it were in his pocket with skinny jeans. He nodded to the other boy, who had long hair and a red hat. They left as we sat down on the metal bench next to the ice cream stand. Hmm. I'd take a double scoop of moose tracks, Marco said. Ice cream sounds so gross right now, I said. My stomach rumbled. It's the shrooms, dude. It's not exactly food poisoning, but sometimes they don't agree with the system. Great, I said. Getting sick in a public place didn't exactly sound like the exotic spiritual getaway that I thought was coming. How do you feel? Alicia asked, with a slightly dreamy, fascinated look on her face. Oh man, Marco said. Just enjoy the journey, my friends. I wanted to tell Marco to stop being such a cliché. But I could feel that creeping introversion, that inability to say what I was thinking. I was beginning to get paranoid, but then the lamp on the edge of the park started glowing brighter and brighter. In the center, it was the clearest white light I'd ever seen, but it bled to yellow and then pink at the edges, like it was a star from a distant world hovering right in front of me. The light was reflecting off the links of the fence, and then it came alive and danced like Tinkerbell off of Peter Pan. I pointed at it, and as I traced my finger across the air, a trail of green mist floated from the tip of my finger, and then I realized that no one else was seeing what I was seeing, because they hadn't noticed me. I dropped my head and looked down. Dude, you okay? Alicia asked. I gave Alicia a reassuring nod, but when I looked at her, I couldn't help but focus on the contrast of the sharp angles of her cheekbones against the soft and delicate curvature of her full lips. Her tan skin, with her spiky blonde bun, was the perfect frame for her blue eyes. She looked like some sort of ancient princess. But again, not at all, because she was just Alicia. Motion caught my eyes as something darted behind the bushes. Alicia giggled, and then her face slackened. It was happening to her, too. It's just a cat, Marco said. I ate some brownies to try to keep up with you guys. But I'm so desensitized to THC. I tried looking at Marco, but it looked like there were worms slithering and wriggling around inside of his dreadlocks. I looked instead at the grass, which was waving gently in the breeze. I put my hand up and couldn't feel any wind. I looked back down to see that the grass was still erect, like a million tiny soldiers standing at attention and watching my every move. I leaned left, and it leaned left with me. I leaned right, and it leaned right. I bobbed my head and each individual blade bent its tip. I started dancing, and the whole field across from the park got down. Whoa, Alicia said, noticing but not noticing me. I felt like the whole world had stopped, and she was judging me. But then she said, This is intense, and turned away. I stood up and all of the grass laid flat, and when I sat back down, it all stood up. I put my hand over my face and played peekaboo with it. I laughed, and a million miniature giggles reflected on me. When I realized what I was doing, everything went back to normal, and I saw Marco smirking at me. I tried to explain myself, but all I could come up with was Kentucky Blue Hoedown. Alicia got up and started walking along the railroad ties that surrounded the perimeter of the playground. She stepped, keeping balance with her arms out, and let each foot fall slowly, and each time her foot touched, she would giggle and then take a breath. 
hold it, and then let it out with a giggle when her next foot touched down. Dude, do you know what I don't understand? Marco started, and as I watched him talk, his facial features fell from one side of his face to the other, and then his mouth started chasing his eyes and nose around the blank slate where his face had been, like Pac-Man chasing ghosts in the old arcade game. There was a question, playing in some kind of loop, that kept coming out of his mouth. I couldn't quite understand it. But it was as though that strange moment was replaying itself over and over again. Him speaking, his face falling apart, and the echo of the question. Just when I felt like I'd never get out of that moment, everything moved forward like a DVD recovering from a skip caused by a scratch. When it did, I found Marco laughing at me. I tried to ask him what he was laughing about, but it all came out as more of a gurgle than an actual word, which made him laugh harder. I turned back to Alicia, who was now laying in the grass, which was cursing her and mourning those the giant had flattened. That is when I saw it. Just above her, there was the familiar wrinkling in the light, as though something was there, but it wasn't at the same time. It was thin, but not as thin as the one in my apartment. But this time, it started pushing out immediately. We should go for a walk, Alicia said, she being the active sort when affected. I had felt as though I had grown roots into the bench and when I looked down, my feet were sunk into the concrete sidewalk. I tried to speak, but the only thing I seemed to be able to say was, Time is getting weird. Let's go, Alicia said, and sat up. Directly above her, four or five feet off of the ground, something was trying to push through. The light bent outward, as though the forest behind her were just a painting on a thin plastic, and someone was pressing against it on the other side. Even the grass was staring in wonder. I stood up and nearly floated up off the ground. Get it straight, man, I thought, but I wasn't sure what that meant. My thoughts didn't even make sense to me. Focus on something real, I thought, and that is when I remembered the carnival. Go, I said, and got up and began to walk. Alicia followed me. Jeez, dude, Marco said, but I didn't care. We went through the forested path to the derelict carnival. It was eerie in the near dark. There were a few street lights that the city had added that ran year-round, even when the carnival stopped coming. It was a fixture of the walking path now a near historical sight. In the dim light, the fading kaleidoscope of colors whispered the ghost of exuberance. Through the peeling paint and the hollow of desertion, I could hear the faint laughter of merry children and the delicate, slightly discordant whistles of the calliope. Calliope, I said and then laughed somehow internally. Alicia giggled, and Marco shrugged. He looked put off, like he didn't want to be there. Alicia climbed into an old carousel, the plastic horses still and silent. She took her vest off and her boots, and then she ostentatiously pumped her hips as though the horses were real and she were riding it. God started to move underneath her. I closed my eyes and thought it away. I needed to, to stay in control. And when I opened my eyes, it was back to being a dead piece of forgotten plastic. But Alicia was definitely alive. And now she was just in her bra and underwear. She was right. It was getting hot. I pulled off my shirt and shoes. Marco went over to a booth that used to serve cotton candy and dug through the shelves in the compartments. Was he talking to himself? 
I thought, but I didn't really care. I was still hearing children laughing and the calliope playing somewhere at another time. I climbed onto the horse with Alicia and grabbed onto the plastic pole with one hand and ran my hand across her belly. Her skin was soft and warm, but her abs were firm, a goddamn playground of texture. I dropped my other hand to her breast and found a similar paradox of soft and firm all at the same time. Everywhere I touched her, there were a thousand sensations sending electricity across my body as the carnival began to disappear, and we sat on a horse in a vortex of colors and electricity. She leaned back into me and put her hand on the back of my head and pulled me into her neck. Were we making love? I couldn't tell. But every sense in my body was tuned into her. And God, she was naked. I was naked. It was pure nirvana. Dude, ha a teddy bear! Marco shouted from the booth where he'd found an old discarded stuffed animal. One of its eyes had been scratched off and the stuffing pulled out of the hole. I looked around, surprised that I was fully clothed. Alicia was still wearing her pants and tank top. I was sitting on the plastic horse with her, but we weren't even touching. Was I erect? Had I wet my pants? No. God, there were sensations coursing over my body without provocation. I climbed down from the horse and went and sat on a bench, running my hands over the weathered wooden planks, flaking paint and rusted bolts. It was a brief come down, but it was just long enough for me to see something familiar on the other side of the carousel. It was the high striker, the hammer and bell setup. I got up from the bench and tried to ignore the fact that my legs had grown long and my feet so large that it was as though I were a clown on stilts. I ignored what I was seeing, and most everything went back to normal. I was still in partial control. I walked over and looked up to the top of the high striker, and it looked as though it were a ten-story tower, and I were just an ant. But then, when I looked down at the striking pad, I saw that it looked equally far away. I ignored it and searched for the hammer, and to my surprise, at the back side of the tower, there was a compartment where an extra hammer had been stored. I grabbed it, and knowing just where to stand and where to strike, I brought down the hammer, which also looked cartoonish and oversized, and sent the bell all the way up to the top of the tower. It rang out and sent a pair of birds flying away from a bush. Marco and Alicia came over and looked amazed. Grand prize, I said, and reached towards the bear. Marco held it out, but then I looked into its missing eye, and I let Marco keep it. Want to try? I asked. Marco took the hammer and stepped back, lifted it high over his head, and then swung it with all of his strength. The weight went about halfway up and then impotently dropped back down to the ground. He laughed. Alicia tried and had a little more success. Each hit sent the weight into the air to what felt like an arbitrary height. They all laughed, and each time I sent the block to the top, and each time they failed. Dude, you're like Thor, Marco beamed. Where are you hiding those muscles? Alicia said as she ran her hands all over my body, as if each inch were something new and interesting. I saw electric blue light rippling from wherever her hands touched me. I nearly dropped the hammer. It's all where you put your feet, I said as I stomped on the spot on the mat and sent the weight to the top of the bell. You have to stomp on the lever right as the hammer hits the pad. I thought about the sad clown with his cut-off jacket, and right then I could smell whiskey and cigars. I looked around. There was something strange happening to the light next to the high striker platform where Marco was goofing off with the mallet.
He was trying to lift it over his head with one hand, as though he were doing some sort of shoulder exercise. Alicia had wandered off back towards the carousel, doing the same slow, one-foot-at-a-time steps she had been practicing on the railroad ties, but now she was just walking down the middle of the sidewalk in this manner. The air seemed cold, much colder than it had been, and I felt a sudden foreboding. I couldn't call out. I was frozen, trapped inside of myself as I ascended towards another peak. Time was moving in nonlinear patterns. I was trapped in a loop. Marco shouted and held the mallet over his head, and then a hand shot through the distortion and grabbed Marco by the wrist and snapped his arm sideways like a twig. A little spurt of blood shot out from the stringy, bony mess of meat that was his disfigured arm. The wrinkle in reality widened, and screams escaped as the man I'd seen so long ago, the sad clown, stepped through. He looked exactly the same. He was wearing jeans and a cut-off vest, revealing his muscular, tattooed arms. Then it started over. Alicia was walking. I was peeking. Marco was being broken as the man stepped through. I don't know how many times this happened before I was able to act or react. I don't know if these loops were happening or if they are just distorted memories from a heavily altered mind. That is what my shrink would suggest. The next thing I knew, the sad clown was standing over Marco looking at him with his white face and red nose. His greasy hair was back in a ponytail, and a large red frown was painted over his white face. He swung the mallet again and again, each strike reducing the size and shape of Marco's head from a human skull to an impact blood smear, like a spot on the road after a pickup truck has creamed a deer on the highway. The sad clown stomped on the lever as he smashed Marco's head one final time. The weight dinged off of the bell, and he smiled beneath his eternal red frown. He picked up the stuffed bear and then frowned as he saw it was missing an eye. He turned towards me, and it was as though I had traveled back into time into my childhood. I turned to run towards Alicia. I cried out, Clown! As I took her arm and pulled her away, she resisted, but was very impressionable in her state. I was scared and running, so she was scared and running. I was bringing her into my nightmare because our guide was dead. We came to a stop in the woods just outside of the circus. My heart was pounding in my chest. I felt like I was either going to explode or slow to a stop. I tried to calm myself down, but my body was mixing other chemicals in with the stimulants that were already in my veins. My bloodstream was a concoction made for a heart attack. Alicia looked shocked and freaked out. Dude, that was not cool. What are you doing? She said as she wiped tears from her eyes. He's back, I said. And then I began to walk back and forth. I had to move. My heart was pumping far too fast for my body to be still. I started to hear heart monitors in the background. I was going to end this night in the hospital or worse. Am I already dying, I thought? What a waste my life was going to be if I was found dead from some stupid mushrooms. Was any of this real? I was looking around at the forest and Alicia, and it all looked real for the moment. But what about Marco? I looked down. My legs were spattered with his blood. My, my legs. What about them? Alicia said, and then nervously glanced up, as though something was moving above my head. I looked up, but didn't see anything. 
I tried to tell her that they were covered in Marco's blood. My legs, why wouldn't she look at them? I tried to tell her that Marco was dead, that I'd seen something come through a hole in the world that had just killed him. But all I said was, the sad clown is back. I could hear reasonable thoughts in my head, but whatever connected them to the ability to express myself was broken and probably would be for another three hours until I finally came down. Alicia giggled and walked back towards the circus. I followed her, glancing over my shoulder at every little noise that echoed through the forest. I held out a small sliver of hope that Marco was still playing with the mallet and that it had all been the drugs. Man, if it had been, then I definitely would laugh about it all later. I felt my mood lift. And as it did, everything in the park seemed to take a brighter, cheerier hue. Alicia was now skipping towards the high striker, saying, Marco, as though she were playing a game of Marco Polo. I never heard a response, but she seemed to, so I followed her. And her light mood played on my sense that it had all been just the beginning of a really bad trip. Her ability to bring me out of it made me feel for a moment that I truly loved her. When I had this thought, a nearly yellow glow seemed to frame her as she skipped along the path. The calliope began to play cheerful tunes, and I could nearly hear the voices of the children who had played at the circus. Then we reached the striker. Marco, Alicia said as she giggled and put her arm out as though it were around someone, I didn't get it. There was no one there. There was nobody there. Where was Marco? I looked around for Marco, and then back at Alicia, who was leaning her head against nothing as though it were resting on a shoulder. She was speaking to someone about something, but I couldn't make any of it out. I could feel my heart rate increasing, and that is when the voice appeared again. I could see him. It was Marco who had his arm around Alicia, but it wasn't the Marco we'd come to the park with. This Marco's face was blank, and the backside of his head was smashed and bloody. Alicia didn't see it, though. It wasn't until she turned towards me and saw my face that she turned and took a good look at Marco. She screamed. The sad clown stepped out from behind the striker. We'd walked right back to it. It was real. Alicia had seen Marco, or whatever it was. She screamed again as the clown punched her in the back of the head, knocking her to the ground. Then he turned to me. But my heart rate seemed to be doing the trick for him, because before he could reach me, everything went black. I slipped into some kind of dream. It wasn't entirely unaffected by the drugs, because it was clear and real as any lucid dream I'd ever had. But it made no sense. I was dressed like the sad clown. But I wasn't acting in the circus. I was bludgeoning a man with a mallet. His head smashed like a melon, all the red, crisp insides turning into mush. Then I was in the forest, at another circus. A woman had won a prize while I was running the ring-a-bottle booth. So I drug her into the woods and forced her jaws open. She tried to scream, so I thumped her in the back of the head with the weighted bottle. It was strong and it didn't break. I reached into a bag and pulled out another bottle. It was smooth glass that was slightly green looking, like an old Coca-Cola bottle. And I shoved it down her throat. The dream kept going, and I was always dressed like the clown in each one and I murdered somebody in a horrible and unusual way. Then I woke up. When I came to, I was in the main tent in a pit of sand. The seats were all empty except for Marco's corpse, which had been propped up. A smile was painted onto his face with his own blood. A one-eyed bear sat next to him with a blood frown painted onto it. There was a drum roll, and then a spotlight shone down on Alicia and I. She was conscious and whimpering. 
The clown stumbled over with a bottle of whiskey in its hands. He walked over to Alicia, where he dropped the mallet. My heart began to race. His pants began to extend as a cartoonish and large protrusion pressed the front of his pants outward. He reached up to honk his nose, but there was no fake clown nose there. He looked at me, shrugged, and then he looked at his crotch. He looked back up at me with a childish look of wonder on his face as he reached one hand down cautiously and then squeezed the end of his massive erection. A honk like a trumpet blast echoed through the empty circus tent. The sad clown bent into a silent mime's laughter as he jumped around slapping his knee and honking his pecker right next to Alicia's barely conscious head each time it blasted like a trumpet. Then he picked up the hammer, looked at me, pretended to wipe the paint tear from his cheek. As he frowned again, he turned towards Alicia, and I blacked out into the sound of my own screams. I woke up the next day in the hospital. The night before had seemed like a bad dream. But I knew it wasn't, not entirely, because a police officer was sitting beside the bed when I woke up. I was strapped down. Do you remember anything? He asked. I told him that I remembered, but he didn't seem to believe any of it. Apparently, I was so messed up that I'd nearly been in a state of cardiac arrest. A cop had found me wandering down the street, shouting for help and talking about a murder that I had witnessed. They never found Marco or Alicia. They never found anything. And eventually, the story became that the two had run off together on a huge drug binge, probably bound for Mexico. Now, I live at home, where I work around my parents' house. I draw sometimes. But when I do, it all begins to come back. The violent images of the sad cloud, Marco's head crushed against the high striker, the distortion. I terrify my parents now. But my shrink says it is good for me to keep drawing. I have sessions twice a week. Sometimes during them, I begin to have flashbacks. And when I do... I think I see something pushing outward in the air behind my shrink's head. One time, I thought I saw a very bloody, very feminine hand reaching through. It nearly grabbed the back of my shrink's bald head, but then it disappeared. It gets worse every week, but he never notices. But I'm starting to look forward to it. I wonder what will happen when I go see him this afternoon. Will I see her again? I sometimes wonder if it is better to be insane or to be sane and know that the world isn't. I'm at my shrink now. He's sitting in his brown leather chair looking at me over his wire-rimmed spectacles. Why do you think that you saw your friends murdered? He asked for the one hundredth time. Well, probably because I was really high the last time I saw them. I answer with a smirk. He doesn't seem to think this is funny, but I do. I laugh and laugh because he doesn't see the hand coming through the air. It's big and scarred, and the arm is tattooed. Have you been smoking? The shrink says with a pause, seeming to smell the air. Is that, is that whiskey? I laugh so hard that I black out.
fuck. I feel like I just YOLO'd. Twice. Ugh, man. I fell asleep? I should really lay off the late night Lovecraft reading. I thought for a second I really had body swapped with that pig. Wait. What is that? What is that? The ground is so close. My body parts are dragging on it. Oh god. I really am inside the pig. It tastes like bacon in here. How's the view from ham height, you little bitch? <laughs> oh shit, my head hurts. It's so weird that I'm at Brett's. I, I can't remember. Puggles, how did you get here? He followed you like normal. Oh. Well, hey, did you like this week's episode? Yeah, I just listened to it. Fucking creepy clown, real original. Okay, dick. Dude, what's wrong with your voice? Too much hot Indonesian action last night. Uh. I remember it now. Matt and I summoned it. The Desolator of Abath Kanath. Way back in teaser episode one, holy shit. A demon who destroys universes. When we summoned him, a pig appeared, and then the pig possessed Matt. Now he's taken my body and I'm... Oh god, I'm a tiny pig. I thought being consumed and then reborn through the bowels of the river beast was uncomfortable. I stink, and I can smell it. I can smell everything. I may have to rethink those all-natural cleaners. My apartment is... Pungent. Wait, now hold that thought, Matthew. One second, I need to check. Ow, Brett, get your hands out of your pants, dude. That's weird. Huh. Didn't think about that. Looks so big on the pig. Looks just normal on this dude. Okay, I can't remember exactly how we're, we got here, but Puggles... Uh, Puggles, we need to go. Puggles? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking pig probably has his junk stuck in something again. Oh, there you are. Why, why are you in this room? You look condescending. I mean, different. Are you reading a book? <laughs> kind of looked like you just answered me. <laughs> um, this is weird. It's always so weird in Brett's house. Hey, what's the matter with you? Why am I talking to a pig? Okay, off the book, buddy. Wait, you have a pin in your mouth and you've circled something? This is Brett's handwriting, and it looks like a drawing of his apartment? Why have you circled a room down in the basement? In an exorcism room? Brett has a room made for, it says, quickly returning their souls to the appropriate body. <laughs> this is too weird. Now I'm only going to say this out loud because it is to a pig. But if I were just looking at everything at face value, I'd... Oh, God. Brett, you aren't inside of the pig, are you? <laughs> Fuck. Oh wait. <laughs> you're you're inside of my pig? Do you like the sausage, Brett? Did you need the sausage? Couldn't pass up those ham hocks, could you? You had to get inside of them. <laughs> There's a special place in Alabama for people like you, sinner. Ow! Stop biting me. Wait, wait. Puggles has bit me before. Oh god. He's bitten pieces off of me. Brett, I'm remembering. Oh, God, I'm remembering. If you're inside of Puggles, what is inside of you? <laughs> Probably a dildo. A sausage dildo. Ah, okay, okay, this is serious. Since you know what I'm saying. There, uh, is there a demon in a Brett skin suit and a Brett in a pig? Oh, you've really fucked us this time. Right? 
The exorcism room? How do we get puggles into the exorcism room? Wait, you also circled a number for a hooker? Who the hell is here? Oh. Oh. Hey, sweet thing. Can I call you sweet thing? You can call me whatever you want for 75 an hour. Not what I was expecting, but what the hell. Nothing better to do in this spudfucker's apartment. Brett, I see you've met J Janice? Janine! But who cares? It used to be Roddy. All right. Uh, well, the party's in the back. <laughs> huh. Sounds like I might have to charge double. Yeah, uh, just follow the sounds of the pig into that door there. Oh, wow. I haven't seen that kind of stretcher since the 70s. Can't even use those in the red light district in Bangkok. All right, honey, here comes your sweet daddy pork chop. Uh, wait, what is that? What's in this room? Oh, God. Not that. Anything but... Oh, God, I hope it worked. Jesus, okay. All right, all right. I hope it worked. Brett, are you... Are you Brett? Oh, thank Humbaba. It tastes like Brett in here. And he's back. Great. Uh, sorry, Janet? <coughs> ah, good Christ, what? Who dumped the ashtray down this dick woman's throat? Puggles? What? Oh, God. Janelle? Janelle? <coughs> I am the desolator of Abbas Ganath and apparently too many unfiltered cigarettes. Monster Board is a production of Warpbox Media. This week's story was written and performed by Matt Cummins. The one is too cheap to pay. Please rate and review on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. Shut up, you... <coughs> This voice box sucks, just like me. So what are you doing, you tall drink of water? Puggles? Just fucking with you. Go die in a pit of misery. I already am. Thank you for all the new reviews and follows on social media. 